Good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Mike, uh, First Social Circle. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I suppose, like many of you, I woke up um, a little disappointed. Um, maybe a little disappointed we didn't get any snow, uh, but certainly disappointed that we uh, that we're not meeting together today. And um, certainly don't want to throw off on the weather forecasters, but I did see a. Uh, a buddy of mine posted this morning, what does it take to get fired as a weathercaster? Um, you know, the weather is what it is. And, uh, but I do thank you for trusting us to make the best decisions we can make and uh, certainly, certainly miss out on the chance to be together today. But I am thankful for this platform that allows us to, uh, to interact together in times like this. And, uh, maybe one of the benefits of this pandemic is it's opened up new ministry opportunities for us. And so thank you for, thank you for patience. Thank you for understanding. And, and thank you for joining today. And I hope you'll comment, that you'll share, that you'll interact with the platform today, just so we can know that you're there and that you're worshiping along with us today. And I'm just thankful to be able to gather together. Um, as we begin this new year together, um, at least my heart's been focused on what uh, what are we going to do positive moving forward and growing God's kingdom in the coming year. And I've been uh, preaching a series of messages just to get us to think about those kinds of themes and um, certainly had intended as part of that series, there's a message that I want to share that is specific to First Baptist Church of Social Circle. Now, if you're watching from another church, you can, uh, um, you can uh, pray and envision how that may flesh out in your own church, but um, to share some specific ministry updates, some numbers and some, some things about who we are and our effectiveness as we plan moving forward. Um, I pushed that sermon back another week at the Lord Terry's um, so that we can do that face to face. Uh, but I do want you to know it's still in my heart, and, and I don't want anybody to check out on me. I don't want anybody to miss anything. You know, we're we're standing on the precipice of uh, phenomenal growth in our area. Um, and I shared with someone recently that because of things that are happening in our own community, um, you know, things are there's a possibility for businesses being changed. And I my comment as a pastor was, yeah, it's going to help my business too uh, when it brings people to the community if that fleshes out, um, because it just means more opportunity for us to share the gospel with more and more people. And so we certainly want to do that. We want to engage our effectiveness and we want to plan to be more effective. And so those are the kind of things I'm thinking about as we move into the coming year. And um, related to that, there's a, um, a just a message that I felt drawn to today to kind of help focus a little bit about our mindset moving forward. Um, you know, I, I, it was interesting to me that today, January the 16th, uh, we are 4% through uh, 2022. Man, the time just seems to be flying by. And so the question that I would ask is a question I found from another writer. It's actually a quote from C.S. Lewis that said, Is God in your plans? Uh, the central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. And so for us, the new year simply represents uh, a fresh start. And as you and I come today, I, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Uh, it's an unusual passage maybe for the day, but I do think there's a lesson for us to learn here from the Lord himself as he was preparing for the ministry tasks that God had called him to. Um, you know, before the feast, uh, the feast of the Passover, um, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, um, that he would depart uh, out of this world to the Father. And having, uh, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, during the supper, the devil had already put into, uh, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of, si uh, the son of Simeon, let me get my glasses, um, the son of Simon, to uh, betray him. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things to his hands and that he had come from God, and he was going back to God, got up from the supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. And then he poured water in the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and wiped them with a towel, which he had girded him. When he came to Simon Peter, he said, um, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, um, do not realize, what I, what, you, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand later. And Peter said, uh, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said, If I don't wash you, then you have no part with me. And Simon said to him, Lord, then wash not just my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to cleanse, uh, wash his feet, but is completely clean. You're clean, but not all of you. That's probably a reference to, to Judas that scared himself. 
And for he knew that the one who was betraying, for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. And so uh, when he had washed his feet and taken his garments, he reclined at the table and said to him, don't you, um, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and right you are, for so I am. If then the Lord and the teacher wash your feet, so you should also wash one another's feet. For I've given an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. For if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I don't speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is the, that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread uh, has lifted up his hand against me. <clears throat> and from now on, I'm telling you that before he comes to pass that um, when, it shall, when it does occur, that you'll believe uh, that I am he. Truly, I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, in this passage, John is providing some interesting perspective for us um, because he's, he's outlining for us Jesus' understanding of the task and the ministry to which he's called. And, um, you know, kind of empowers my thinking, um, you know, as, as moving into the, uh, the coming of a new year or the beginning of a new ministry cycle, uh, a couple of basic questions that ought to motivate us. It's a mindset that we ought to have. And the first thing is, if you're going to do something big for, for the kingdom of God, if you're going to do something big in your own life, uh, the first thing you need to know is you need who you are. And, um, and then in this context, you need to know who you are in, in God or in Christ. And, um, you know, if, if we don't know who we are, then we spend all of our energy doing things to define our identity, trying to discover who we are. Uh, much of the cultural chaos that, that exists in our world today is because people are trying to figure out who they are. Uh, they don't feel confident. They don't feel content in who they are. And tragically, there's no attainment. There's no honor. There's no accomplishment. There's no identity. There's no amount of human recognition that'll ever adequately satisfy us. So why is that? Because our identity is not found in what you do. Our identity is found in who you are. And that's why Paul spends so much time talking about who believers are in Christ, Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us before him and before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with his will and his pleasure. And he goes on to say uh, in Ephesians 2, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we don't, you don't minister to find out who you are. You minister because of who you are. And there are a lot of people today who um, they either they're ineffective in ministry or they're misguided in ministry because they're doing ministry to define themselves when we should do ministry out of our identity. It is who we are. That motivates us. In this context, Jesus washing his disciples' feet, you'll notice three quick things. You'll notice that, uh, first of all, Jesus knew that he had the authority to do what his father sent him to do. He knew what the task was, and, um, and, and he knew where he was going. He knew where all of this was leading. And so Jesus knew that the father had put all things uh, under his power. And, and so for you and I, it looks like 13 helpless men hiding in the dark um, from Roman uh, powers and from religious leaders. But in reality, in that room, there, there was the power of the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ himself. And he was not some uh, helpless victim of everything. He knew that he had the authority that came from God himself. Um, he knew that his father had put all things under his feet. He had all the power, all the authority. He's not insecure about his identity. Uh, he's not taking some lowly task in order to prove to the disciples anything other than, he even tells us in the passage why he did it. He did it that we might have an example to follow. He didn't have to. He didn't need to. He chose to, to show us how to accomplish the task that God's called us here to do. Jesus knew where his authority came from. He, he, he knew that he had the authority and the power of God. What else did he know about himself? He knew what his task was. Uh, Jesus knew the commission. Um, he knew what waited before him. He's not acting of his own initiative. He's sent by his father on a specific mission, that is to die an atoning death on, uh, on the cross for each one of us. And being sent implies a backing. Um, when you and I are operating in the, in the obedience and the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the authority and the backing of God. Jesus knew that he had come from God 
And, and one of the great themes of the Gospel of John is the sense of mission and purpose and commission in Jesus' life. And, and Jesus um, has now sent you and me with that same kind of authority. In John 20, 21, as the Father had sent me, so send I you. And uh, when you and I embrace uh, the calling of God on our lives to, to do and to share. And maybe you're watching this video. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't, you don't have that, feel that closeness with God. Maybe, maybe you're, uh, maybe you're, you're distant from church or maybe you're not even a church person. Um, and, and so maybe you're, you're questioning what, what does this mean for me? Well, one of the things it means is Jesus understood he had all the authority and he understood why he came. He came that he might save Sinners. Well, certainly that's all of us. The scripture affirms that uh, repeatedly. So sometimes even in ministry, I have to go back and remind myself why I do what I do. You know, why in the world, uh, <clears throat> why in the world would you invest yourself in, in a ministry in a local church? Or why, why would you give the monies that you give? Why would you volunteer to teach uh, uh, children in some crowded room somewhere? Why, why, would you, why would you repeatedly show up time after time after time wondering, is, it, is anybody going to show up or, or being overwhelmed by the crowd? Um, why would you volunteer to, to stand on a platform and put yourself out there in front of other people? Well, you would do it if you had an understanding of the commission that which you're called. Um, Jesus has given to us a commission, Matthew 25, 40, and the king answered and said to him, surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, you did it to me. Um, Jesus understood his authority. He understood the task before him, but he also understood where this is all leading. He understood his destination. Jesus knew that he came from the Father and that he was going to return to the Father. Listen, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and that he was returning to God. Have you ever noticed that we only talk about heaven in terms of death? Uh, we don't, sometimes we don't talk about heaven um, in, in moments when we're confronted with the reality of death instead of talking about heaven in terms of life. Um, the cares of life kind of occupy our minds and we get so caught up in the daily activities that we forget where all of this is leading. Um, soon and very soon, there's an old song that we used to sing, I'm going to see the king. Um, is, that, is that something that is part of your thinking when it comes to doing what God um, wants you to do? That um, all of this is leading somewhere. You, you know, after a lengthy discussion about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brethren, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Now, now how many of us watching today consider ourselves servants of the Lord? Um, how many of us consider it a joy to serve? And how many of us remember where, where this is leading? Uh, Paul reminds the church at Corinth of something you and I need to be reminded of. When you labor for the Lord, it's not in vain. Why? Because um, your labor is not in vain when it's unto the Lord, because this leads somewhere. All of this is not just, it's not just spiritual busy work. Uh, and I've said it in times past in some of my messages that it God just impresses on my heart that this is not just, uh, this is not just behavior control. Um, this is, in spite of what the uh, opponents to Christianity might say, this, this is not some, it's not some attempt to bypass the cares and concerns of life, even though that's a blessing and benefit because God strengthens you through those things. The whole goal of all this is not just to, it, it, it's, it's not just to um, find our identity in doing and saying certain things. Our identity is found in what we believe uh, about who we are in Christ, and, and to, to, um, um, to be in him. Um, there's a word that I'm going to be hearing a lot this year. It's the word abide. Um, my wife chooses every year some, some theme or some word that kind of motivates her and keeps her, keeps her focused throughout the course of a year's time. And, 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 and I believe that this year she's uh, focusing on the word abide. And what would that mean for me? To abide means to remain in. And not only I remain in him, but he remains in me. And that's the marvelous part. And so Jesus understood what it was that he was called to do. He, he, understood, his, uh, he understood who he was. And that's what motivated him to do what he did. Are you motivated by who you are? Do you find your identity in your work 
or do you find your identity in who you are in Christ? And then that motivates the work. And the second part of that would be, so, so not only um, uh, know who you are, uh, but then you have to know who it is you're serving. Um, in verse 1, it makes it very clear that Jesus knew that the time had, was drawing near. Uh, having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. You know, love's a certainly a popular topic and uh, becomes more so this time of year to get closer to February. Um, love is, is the dynamic that, that we believe love makes the world go round. Uh, but I want to remind what the scripture says. The scripture says that God is love. Uh, we have no capacity to understand true uh, love apart from understanding God because God is love. Everything else that we, um, uh, that humans would, would associate with love are all physical things. When love is much, much deeper than just a physical thing, it, it, it is a, it is a, it's a, it's a characteristic of who God is. And, and love is what causes a person to sacrifice themselves and for the gain or for the well-being of somebody else. Love is what motivated Jesus to pay the ultimate price, the beating and the, the abuse of his own body, um, his own death, which then leads to his powerful resurrection. Um, how, how can you and I love? Well, we have to, number one, we have to know who we are, and then we have to know who it is that we're serving. Um, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, um, you are why I pay this price. Uh, you, you're why I came. And so you, you, not only do we know who we are, we know who he is and we know who we're serving. And, and there are two aspects of that. We're serving Jesus. I always think of it in these terms. We serve Jesus. Uh, how do you describe him? Savior and Lord. Well, to, to know it, that we, you serve or we should serve Christ as our Savior, the one who has rescued us. What's he saved us from? Everything. He has saved us from hurt, from harm, from confusion, from doubt, from fear. Uh, he saves us from death and punishment and penalty. Um, he, he saves us from uh, deception and uh, from distraction. Um, Christ saves us. Ultimately, he saves our eternal existence. You know, I, I repeatedly say that uh, uh, we all have everlasting, we all have eternal life. That is, we all will live somewhere. Uh, Jesus helps determine where we will spend that eternity. He saves us from hell and from punishment and separation and agony, and instead it makes access to peace and pleasure and power and authority and the glory of God's presence for all of eternity. Hebrews 12, we're told that Jesus endured the cross, and there's no, no greater example of sacrifice and love that someone would endure agony for our benefit. Listen to what Hebrews 12 1 says. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. You know, to know Christ, it, to know who we serve, and to know him as Savior motivates us to serve him. But we don't just know him as Savior, we know him as Lord. What does that mean? To know Christ as Lord means to know him as authority. Uh, lordship is authority. Christ is the authority for our lives. He is the authority over all of nature. Um, um, one writer said, no snowflake ever falls in the wrong place. God is the authority and Christ is the authority as the Son of God. Um, you know, in, uh, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus rebukes the wind and the storm simply by speaking. His mastery over the laws of nature and the forces of ele uh, the, the elements and the forces of nature are an absolute demonstration that He is Lord over the created universe. Uh, he is Lord over um, all of uh, all of the powers that work in the world. Romans thirteen one. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Um, every, every, everyone who has power and authority in this world only have it because the one who has ultimate power has granted them such. And we may not understand what all that means, but it simply reminds us that God has, has ultimate authority. Christ as the, uh, the, the son of God, the second person of the triune God, the second person of the Trinity has authority over all of creation 
and uh, he has control over all that he has created, and that would include us. Um, Christ is Lord. He is authority over everything that exists. He's the Lord over you and me. Um, now, there are two types of sin that are common to human beings. One is self-dependence, and the other is self-exaltation. Or that is, we, we depend on ourselves, and we exalt ourselves. And Christ is Lord over us. At least he should be. Certainly for those who claim his name. Certainly for those who, who trust him. Um, one of the words that we want to capture in our lives and in the ministry of this church is lordship. And, and I love how a dear friend of mine uh, quotes it. He said, who sits on the throne of your life? And you, you have to ask yourself that question. Whenever there's some decision that comes up, or when there's something that takes place in your life, who's the authority here? Who sits on the throne of your life? Is it Christ himself? Understand that you will acknowledge Christ as Lord. Um, we, uh, at least I quote often Philippians 2, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acts 10, 36 says, Jesus is Lord of all. And so there's not an inch, one writer said, there's not an inch of any sphere of your life or mine which Christ Jesus the Lord does not say, that belongs to me. And so just thinking about ministry in a coming year and my role in it, your role in it, what is God calling us to do? Um, there are a myriad of things to think about. And one of those is, is God then your plans? Um, why do you do what you do? Because you know who you are and you know who he is. Um, where does all this lead? Uh, does, it, does it have an eternal perspective? Whose kingdom are we building, ours or God's? And, and, then, and then also, do you remember who it is you're serving? Um, because Jesus said, as we serve others, we are serving him. But that's only true if we're serving out of the right spirit, out of the right motive, and, and, and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, knowing Christ is the one we serve and the one to whom, um, who enables us to serve. And I know that just kind of blurs all by on an on a, um, unusual kind of a Sunday morning, um, but I think it's important because what is the mindset for ministry that captures you today? And maybe you're watching this video and you don't have a mindset for ministry. Uh, maybe you're, your focus is on something else. And maybe you're watching uh, today, you just kind of joined us and um, not really given much thought to the consequences of eternity and uh, eternal things. And I just caution you today, listen, if you don't know anything else about the world we live in, know this, uh, life is brief, it's fragile, it can be gone in a phone call in an instant. Um, we never know what the future may hold. <laughs> Obviously, um, you know, we, we were all anxiously watching and listening and trying to learn what the future may hold. And um, we, we now discover it's not what we expected. Uh, friends, you don't want to be caught off guard in, in the face of eternity. And, and, and for Christians, uh, listen, you don't need to, you don't need to minister uh, because, you've, because you're skilled at it. You don't need to minister because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talented. We serve out of who we are because we know who it is that we're serving. We're serving out of Christ Jesus, serving Christ Jesus for the glory of Christ Jesus that others may know what we know. So thank you for, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, I pray that God will bless you. Uh, let me give you a couple of quick reminders before I let you go. Uh, I do want to remind those who are part of our ABCs of uh, Biblical uh, Christ-Honoring Marriage uh, that we'll, Jack and I will be on Facebook Live tonight, and so I hope that you'll join us 6 o'clock if you're a member of that group, and so we'll see you there. Um, also to remind you that, um, um, it, again, if, if we're going to take this message seriously and keep on moving forward, there's so many things that need to happen in the life of a church. God's got great things in store for us, reaching people in new ways and uh, being more effective in ministry, uh, planning for effectiveness. All of those things come into play. And so it only happens if you're involved and if you're engaged. And so I encourage you, if you're a uh, if you're, you know, your church members, uh, First Baptist Social Circle or whatever church you may be a member of, you need to get in, get involved and get going. And uh, don't come along just to say, hey, what y'all need to do is this or that or the other. What you need to pray is, God, what do you want me to do? Uh, how do you want me to be involved? How can I support? How can I be part of what the kingdom is doing? And, and so you do that. And I believe God will bless. He'll bless you. He'll bless your family. He'll bless 
your church. And so um, I also want to thank you for your faithfulness. 2021 was a, a wonderful, uh, rich blessing for the life of our church. And I just want to encourage you, if you're watching our um, uh, post today, please be faithful. Uh, you know, the first of the year is always slow going when it comes to supporting the work of ministry. And so I hope that you will. I hope that you'll be faithful that you can give in a variety of platforms. And I hope that you will, uh, that you can help us keep moving forward. I always feel bad whenever I talk about finances in the face of a church because I have these own memories of, of all these financial failures, and maybe you do too. I don't want anybody to feel pressured, but I think you give out of a, gra a grateful heart. And there's a variety of ways to give, text to give, online giving, uh, good old-fashioned uh, write a check. Um, you know, cash is just good as money. And so there's a way to do that, whether it's our church or your own church. I hope that you'll support financially uh, the work of the ministry. Thank you. Thank you for taking a couple of minutes and joining me this morning. I pray that God will bless you, whatever the rest of the day holds. Um, uh, it's a cliche, but I'll share it with you. Um, we know who holds the future. And so look forward to all that God has in store for you this coming day. So I pray God's richest blessings over you. I would pray that today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, would you bow your head? Would you pray, Lord Jesus, I agree with what the Scripture says about you, that you are Savior and Lord. I agree with what the Scripture says about me. I'm a sinner and I need you. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Save me. Be my Lord. Change me. Help me to live my life for your honor and glory too. I'll see you face to face. And friend, if you'll pray that prayer, let us know that. Uh, you can contact us through Facebook. You can uh, go to our website at firstsocialcircle.com. Click the Connect tab and the resources there. Let us know that you would pray a prayer like that so that we can send you some resources to help you in your new walk with Jesus Christ. Christian, if you'd pray a prayer and say, Lord, help me to be better for you. Help me to, help me to set aside my own agenda in favor of yours and have a kingdom mindset. Uh, I pray you do that today. And I know that God will hear that prayer. And God will bless you. Thank you for your time today. I pray God's richest blessings on you and on your family. In Jesus' name, amen.